Good day and welcome to SEO Bricks Insight where we talk about what's really going on in the BRICS. Now, for almost the last decade, Russia's political and business leaders have marked the start of September with a major international event, the Eastern Economic Forum held in Vladivostok. Now, just like its Saint, uh, sister event, the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, it attracts thousands of attendees from around the world. Now, the forum's initial objective was twofold, to provide support for the accelerated development of the Far East and to integrate the Russian Federation into the Asian trade and economic system and sphere. Now, this task has not been straightforward, as Eastern and Pacific Russia have historically been sparsely populated as a region with a challenging climate and a unique local culture made up of pioneers. Plus, by the mid-2000s, economic ties between Russia and the West were robust and there were few purely commercial reasons to focus on Asia. So it was necessary to take a proactive approach, considering not just what Asia could offer immediately, but with the potential future relations with the states of Asia. I mean, this would help establish a foundation for more easily coming the overcoming the inevitable shift that was going to happen away from the West. Now, the inevitability of this shift began to occur around 15 years ago. This event took much more significance because Russia's complete pivot away from the West and now fully engaging with Asia, the Middle East and the Global South. Now, at the plenary session of the Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok last week, there was a major occurrence that took place that fits with the forum's core theme. Now, the Far Eastern 2030 initiative is combining strengths to create new potential. And the stage at the plenary session was shared by President Putin, the Vice President of China, Hang Sheng, and the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Anwar Ibrahim. I mean, this translates as Russia, China and ASEAN, a key interlocking partnership constantly being strengthened on the road to exploring all the potential of new, equitable and fair in the new multipolar world. Now, before I continue, I'd like to make an appeal. If you like and enjoy my videos, you can help me fund my channel and the website SEO Bricks Insight. Now, you can do this by making a small donation, which can be done by clicking on the thanks button at the bottom of the screen. Everybody who donates does get a personal thank you from me and I'm also going to thank all of you now who are watching because that does mean a lot to me. Now in his address, President Putin focused on what is arguably the most ambitious national development project of the 21st century, the Russian conquest of the East. This is a mirror image of the Chinese commercial conquest of the West, which began in earnest back in 1999 with the export Go West campaign. Now, Mr. Putin provided an overview of the rapid development occurring in the Russian Far East, announcing that over 3,000 techno-industrial projects are currently underway. He also discussed the Northern Sea Route, which the Chinese have dubbed the Arctic Silk Road, plus the plans for new nuclear icebreakers and the development of the Port of Murmansk were also outlined, which will turn that into a major logistics hub. Mr. Putin also noted that the Northern Sea Route's turnover has already reached a record five times that of the era of the United uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The figures relating to the Far East and the Arctic are actually truly impressive. The Far East is strategically important as a macroeconomic region and it makes up 41% of the territory of Russia. Now, the Arctic area itself was immense in natural resources treasure, and it's linked to the national, uh, northern sea route potential. It's 28% of the territory of Russia, 17% of Russia's oil, 83% of its gas, and it has deposits of coal, gold, nickel, copper, cobalt, platinum groups, metals, and diamonds. So it's unsurprising that the recurring Western colonial aspiration is to attack, divide, and plunder Russia exemplified by the current focus on inflicting a strategic defeat of Russia and Ukraine. And this is extricably linked to the desire to exploit the vast wealth of Russia in the Far East and the Arctic. Putin once again highlighted the importance of these two regions as a key priority for Russia in the 21st century, emphasizing their significance for national security. 
Now, there's been a 20% increase in uh, growth in startup capital, which is twice the Ru uh, Russian average in the region. Furthermore, each ruble of state funding is matched by 34 rubles of private investment. Now, the region's key industries now include energy, petrochemicals, mining, timber, logistics, aircraft machinery, shipbuilding, agriculture and fisheries. Now, the Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar said, where's the humanity? I mean, he's an accomplished speaker and he discussed ASEAN, that's the Association of East Asian Nations, role as a pivotal point in Asia-Pacific region and provided a comprehensive analysis of soft power, referencing Russian literature, and this is his first time in Russia, by the way. He emphasised that Russia's significant contributions to human history and thought and highlighted the country's potential to shape the future. He also commended the ascendance of the Global South, which now makes up 40% of the global GDP and over 70% of the population. He mentioned the appeal of the BRICS and Malaysia's formally expressed interest in joining BRICS Plus and the growing importance of Russia as an investment destination for Muslim majority nations. He then took the opportunity to reiterate the national motto of Malaysia truly Asia with a smile. Now Anwar's comments on the Gaza situation and its tragedy obviously resonated with the business and technocrat audience. He stated that he often inquires of his colleagues, even those in the West, where the humanity is evident, how they can speak of justice and how they can predicate human rights and democracy. Now, the Chinese Vice President Hang Seng highlighted the outcomes of the recent high-level meetings in Beijing and Astana, which have reinforced the China-Russia strategic partnership. He also drew attention to the growing trade volume, China's status as a leading trade partner investor in Russia's Far East, and the dr drive to modern the trans-border structures, and obviously President Xi's global security initiative, which is a more ambitious version of the Russian concept of the Greater Eurasian Partnership. Now, Hang Seng was unequivocal in his remarks on China's commitment to a new comprehensive security format, emphasising the need to combat the mentality of the Cold War. He said this is all part of China's overarching concept for the 21st century to build a community with a shared future for mankind. Now, in practical terms, the forum, which was attended by 7,000 delegates from 75 nations, but only a small number came from the West, but a large number of deals uh, with the equivalent of over $59 billion were signed. Now, as in previous years, there was an open-air exhibition by the sea, which was one of the highlights of the event, and it showcased the culture, customs, cuisine, and the natural beauty of the regions of the area, including Primorsky, Sakhalin, Kamchatka, Yakutia, Boratia, and Krasnoyarsk. Now, all of this soft power is integrated into the geopolitical and geoeconomic drive towards the continuous sustainable economic growth from Russia's east to the entire Asia-Pacific region. Now, this is exemplified by the evolving Russia uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations business dialogue. I mean, Connie Bakri, who's an Indonesian security analyst and a professor at St. Petersburg State University's Institute of International Relations, provided a comprehensive overview. He said, the most important thing for the Asia-Pacific region is technology and science. And According to Putin, he emphasised that Russia will play a significant role in developing science and technology across Asia, particularly in the field of nuclear energy security. Now, the Eastern Polygon uh, discussion, which included Igor Letvin, who's an advisor to Putin, he talked about the geoeconomics of the Eastern uh, Polygon and the Pacific region. I mean, the Far East is an emerging pivotal gateway for Russia's international trade. At the Russian ASEAN section, which included a minister from the Eurasian Economic Union, there was a detailed discussion of the developments over the past five years since the start of the Russia ASEAN partnership. The focus was on how Moscow views the region, particularly ASEAN, as a top priority. 
Now, the session examined the potential collaboration across Greater UASA with a particular focus on production chains integrating the organisations of the Eurasian Economic Union, the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation and the BRICS. Now, Karen Knesso, uh, the head of the Gorky uh, Centre, which is the geopolitical observatory on key issues in Russia at the St. Petersburg University, and she's also, by the way, the former Austrian Minister of Foreign Affairs, well, she represented the minority of voices from Russia, uh, from Europe, coming to Russia and calling for reason, dialogue and stability. She had highlighted the alarming decline in the rule of law and the erosion of trust in Western traditional system. She said, it's therefore crucial to emphasise the importance of the BRICS format and what is required as a new normative foundation. There was also fascinating and timely discussions under the themes of instruments of sovereign development in the constant context of the destabilisation of the world order. And that was held by Albert Batskin, who's a director of economics at the Russian Academy of Science. Now, a group of Russian scientists with input from the Japanese and the Chinese has developed a new national strength index. Now, this takes into account a number of variables, including population size, natural resource reserves, military power, economic strength, and the solidity of government, business, and society in order to achieve national development goals. And it comes out as it's all about sovereignty. So the Eastern Economic Forum demonstrated once again that Russia and the major countries of Asia and Southeast Asia are maintaining a calm and collected approach despite the ongoing tensions with the United States and its allies. Now, plus the different geopolitical challenges, Russia and its partners in the BRICS are resolutely pursuing their economic interests together. Despite the ongoing development of the military strategies by the US think tank land and the proposal to form a NATO Arctic Sparta to perceive the decline of American exceptionalism in the north, uh, connections were explored and everybody's looking at the challenges that uh, is now looking at happening on. Now it's unsurprising that the hegemon uh, in the US and the vassals express intense animosity towards Russia, China, Asia in general and Eurasia because they've been outclassed and outwitted. Now they're going to become increasingly irrelevant in the global landscape as their power diminishes and their economies collapse. Anyway, that was the Eastern uh, Economic Forum. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, you can help me fund the channel and the website seobricksinsight.com by pressing the thanks button at the bottom of the screen. Don't forget the comments section. I look forward to receiving and hearing your comments. Thank you.